Welcome to Shovel Talk, a podcast for economic developers. From your friends at the Golden Shovel Agency. Shovel Talk is back. Producer Darren here, and I'm very excited for Amanda to get into episode two of her remote worker series. But first, per usual, where in the world are you, Amanda? Yes. Hi, Darren. And hi, everybody listening. Right now, I am in beautiful London. You know, it is beautiful, but the weather is kind of crazy. You may have heard of that about, about London, how fast the weather can change. And I've been dealing with a little bit about, of that here. I, uh, when I got in, it was thunderstorms and then just constantly back and forth from rain and sun. So it's been interesting. But I think my favorite part so far of London has been visiting one of the seven wonders of the world. Stonehenge is here in London. I visited over the weekend. Um, And if you don't know what Stonehenge is, it's basically a pile of rocks in a field. But they say they're about 5,000 years old. And the wonder of of the world here is that uh, they actually don't know Uh, how they got the stones out there and how they actually stacked them in the way that they are just because of the sheer size of these stones. So yeah, it was very interesting and a a really neat uh, trip to take over the weekend. So let's get into the interview. I will be interviewing my friend, Dim. Uh, Dim is a business owner. He owns a software company and he actually also started a very interesting product-based business through COVID. So I don't want to give everything about him away here. So let's get into the interview. Here is my chat with Adim. Thank you so much, Adim, for being on the podcast today. Um, Let's start with where you're from and um, tell us about your background and career. Okay. So uh, thanks, Amanda, for having me. Um, I'm from Nigeria. I was born in Nigeria, uh, lived here till I was 18, and then went to college in Rochester, New York. And then after college, I worked in Denver, Colorado, in the States for a bit. So I lived totally uh, in the US for about 10 years. And then I moved back to Nigeria to start a software company. So I've been writing software for a, for a while now. I think I started when I was 14 and I am 35 now. So it's been over 20 years. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. And tell us about a business that you started through COVID. Okay, yeah. So in, um, I think this was 2020, right? When COVID started, everybody was like locked in. The lockdown in Nigeria was insane. Like, Mm -hmm. I remember my friends in the US being like, you know, uh, people are being advised to stay home. In Nigeria, there was no advisement. It was like, you had to stay home or you would get arrested. So everybody, oh there was one day in the city I live in, Abuja, there was uh, one day that uh, everybody could go out for grocery shopping. I think it was every Wednesday. But besides that, everybody had to stay home. So there was a lot of time on my hands. Everybody, the whole world was panicking. A lot of contracts I had fell, like got shut down or suspended. So I rarely have free time as uh, most digital nomads who run a business will kind of attest to like there's never, there's always something to do. Or if you just, you don't need to be a digital nomad. If you run a business, there's always something to do. So for the first time in a while, (laughs) I had some (laughs) free time. And then uh, I have a a notebook where I write down like ideas of stuff I would like to do if I ever have free time. And um, the idea I, I picked out was, was, uh, to make a deck of custom playing cards. But instead of the court cards being the French king, queen, or jack, I used people that are uh, from different tribes in Nigeria. I replaced the king, queen, and jack from the four major tribes in Nigeria, which are like the Igbo, Yoruba, Hausa, and Fulani tribe in Nigeria. So yeah, so I started that project. I really wanted to do it for fun. Um, I really just wanted to make a hundred decks of cards for my own amusement and share it with my friends for their birthday presents or whatever. But I wanted to make them at the highest quality ever. So I went to like the printers, the people that built like print cards for Las Vegas casinos and different casinos around the world. And they were like the lowest quantity they could print for me was a thousand deck of cards. And I was like, that just made the whole project super expensive. Yeah. So I ended up being like, I didn't just want to pay for a thousand decks for no reason. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't even know where I would store them. So <laughs> I ended up asking a bunch of people, would they buy this if I made it? And um, one thing led to another, and I started a Kickstarter campaign, 
and it kind of went insane. I was looking for seven thousand dollars to do mm-hmm. this, to do a pre-order, and people ended up contributing up to uh, I think it was fourteen thousand at the end of the wow. uh, campaign. Yes, yeah, so I raised double of what I was intending to, which as a business person signals, there was a demand that I didn't know was there. So I ended up turning it into a business of its own. So I have a second company that makes playing cards now. Wow. That's really cool. Um, I mean, I think that there's a lot of people out there that kind of keep that list. I know I have one of things, you know, that you want to do if, if you ever have the time and a lot of really cool businesses came out of COVID. And I think yours is definitely um, one of the coolest that I, that I've heard of. And uh, when you told us about that in Kenya, I just, I loved the story. And so can you tell us a little bit more about the startup process or the the crowdfunding process? Cause I know there's a number of platforms that you can use. Why did you pick Kickstarter and what did that process look like of getting on there and people actually contributing to your business? It was interesting because my idea of Kickstarter was mitigating risk. Like I have started a lot of projects. As, like I said, I've been uh, writing software since I was 14. So mm-hmm. I've done a lot of mini startups where I like made a website that I thought would be a business and it didn't go as well. I've had many failures in my life for sure. <laughs> on the business front. So one of the key takeaways I do now is like, I like to verify that whatever I'm trying to make is actually wanted by the public, right? So that's where the idea for crowdfunding was important to me was, it was basically testing if there was a demand. So I chose Kickstarter because I used to live in the US and that was the biggest crowdfunding, almost popular crowdfunding program out there. The biggest hurdle I ran into is like Kickstarter doesn't accept projects from Nigeria. Mm. And like, so that was a big hurdle for me because I really wanted to use that. Most of the friends um, that I knew would pre-order were American or uh, they lived in uh, the UK or Europe. So it was something I had to do. At least it felt like that. I didn't do much research to see if there were crowdfunding websites for like for Africans, but I, I haven't ran into any. So I ended up doing partnering with a, law, a high school friend of mine. And that's how he then became my business partner. So he's my business partner on the Natives Card Project now. And so he lives in San Francisco. So I hit him up and I'm like, hey, I'm trying to do this project. Do you think I could borrow your Kickstarter account? To, and I, <laughs> can, can I borrow your Kickstarter account to do this project that I promise I will deliver the product I said so you don't get uh, in trouble? And uh, yeah, this is, uh, his name is Stanley. And he was uh, very kind, very gracious. He ended up trusting me and lending me his Kickstarter project. And because of that, I was like, well, you know, as in, uh, there are many reasons why Stanley is my business partner on this. Like I can go, I can do a whole podcast on why it worked out. Um, Mm -hmm. But um, it became super easy to collaborate with him. And he helped me with a lot of the marketing. I'm good at creating products. He's way better at marketing and sales than I am. So it's a good, we have a lot of uh, complementary skills. So he ended up lending me his Kickstarter and then I did the campaign. Wow, that's awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that you had some failures at the beginning. That really stuck with me because I think it's so important for people to realize or remember or hear stories about, you know, people who've been successful starting businesses, but remembering that, you know, when you weren't just going along and one day said, oh, I'm going to start a business and then, you know, look at your book and pick one and it worked like you had failures <laughs> yeah. to start with. So it's so, I think it's so important to share that, you know, a lot of online businesses definitely popped up through COVID too, where, um, you know, they don't have a physical product. You actually have a physical product, which I think yeah. I would think it makes it a little bit more difficult. So can you tell us about some resources maybe that you used along the way? Yeah, so that's that's a, actually an excellent point you bring up because like I said, all through my life, um, I've only created digital products. Like mm-hmm. I've created a ton of websites, a ton of apps. So doing a physical product, that was a bit unnerving. It was also exciting in a way because like this was something that I could create that I could actually touch. I could right. actually see in a physical space. Yeah. Um, it's definitely different from digital products because, so for example, with the Kickstarter, I did a lot of research on other people's playing card 
custom playing card Kickstarter projects. And there were a lot of common themes. One was a lot of them showed real photogra photographs of the actual deck of cards. But this is actually interesting because the point of Kickstarter is it's a pre-ordering system, right? So mm -hmm. you're, you're buying something that doesn't actually exist yet, but then when you're selling it, you have to set it like it exists because not everyone can think of it in an abstract way. Like you can't just show the images and be like, imagine this on a deck of cards. Like right. many people can do do that like uh, easily. So you have to like get as close to the product, the way it would look, feel, the way you would interact with it. So to solve that, we actually went to the company that manufactured the box and was like, hey, we will do business with you if this works out, but would you take a risk on us and just print us out a couple samples, like 12, 12 boxes. And then we went to a card factory in China because the one we were using of, to do it properly was in the United States. But we went to a card factory in China that allows you to print custom decks of cards at low quantities. And we built, we like, uh, manufactured like 10 decks worth of playing cards to see how they actually looked. And then we put the cards and the boxes together, did a photo shoot, made videos, a bunch of stuff so people could actually see what it looked like. And when they went to the Kickstarter site, they would be like, oh, this is what I'm going to get. So that was something that was very different from um, building digital products, mm -hmm. as I have usually done before. Digital products, I, all I need to do is show you screenshots. And I right. could get away with screenshots of the design mm -hmm. even before I build the product. So this had a lot of work and in financial investment in it to actually even drum up marketing, which was interesting for me, right? Like yeah. um, I, I usually live in a world where marketing, if you're creative, you can get away with it for free. But in this world, you kind of have to pay. You have to put down some money for sure to uh, get any buzz anywhere. Interesting. What would you say is the biggest hurdle that you came across um, in starting the, the business and how did you overcome that? I would say the biggest hurdle was the Kickstarter thing for sure. Because for me, it was it, it was a it felt like a show stopping moment. It's like I had this whole idea. I had already like started putting everything together. I've gotten quotes from manufacturers. I've figured out the artwork. I've, I've, I'm like halfway through the process, and then the way to fund the process immediately seemed impossible. It, it, and this happens in business where you come into like a rude awakening sometimes with what you thought would happen and what is actually happening. I would say the previous times I would be hit with something like this and I would give up. But, you know, if you keep picking up from your failures, uh, one of the things I just learned is like, this is just an obstacle. And, and this is like, and this now led to me having a business partner, right? Because I just myself out there and said hey I need help and somebody was willing to help me so it seems easy in retrospect but uh, at the time it could have shut the whole project down for right. sure right so speaking of of getting help um how would you say that community leaders because I've you know um we work in economic development so we're working with a lot of um cities and counties and a lot of community leaders so how, how can community leaders better support startups like yours? Yeah, so a major issue I run into as an entrepreneur is uh, the ease of doing business. In Nigeria, it's not super easy to just start a company. There are a lot of laws. And then if you're a foreigner, it's like double complex for you. If you're a local, they've been trying to make it easier. So uh, before I started my software company, it used to take months to like register your company. I think mm -hmm. now they've got it down to about a week or two weeks, but okay. it used to be a multi-month process. So something that a lot of, I think, organizations and government, uh, like you said, community leaders mm -hmm. um, don't really take into account is that the easier they make the laws to start businesses to file your taxes to get funding, it definitely encourages people who are risk takers to mm. dive in and create more value for the community. Because there are a lot of people who want to create value, but 
the stumbling blocks seem overwhelming if you're not brave enough. Yeah, it sounds like some like education pieces too, maybe of uh, processes and definitely how to get through some of those those processes as well. Yeah. So, all right, well, let's talk a little bit about travel. So, what drew you to the remote worker and remote work and travel lifestyle? So uh, it's definitely a cornerstone, uh, one of the cornerstones of my life, traveling. Um, I come from a family that, as a kid, we used to leave leave the country every Christmas. Uh, So my dad would uh, actually take a holiday because uh, a little history of my family is um, I come from a family of entrepreneurs also. My mom owned businesses. My dad owns businesses till today. He and he he loves to work. I don't think um, my my the idea of a holiday for my dad is different from with most people in the world. Um, but my mom used to make us travel to different African countries every Christmas. So he would just get out of the country and take a break uh, because if he was in the country, he would probably do work. Also, <laughs> to just expose me and my sister to like different aspects of the world and different cultures. And she used to give us these little assignments. Like my sister would like do the research on the hotels and the restaurants that we're gonna go to. And I would do the research on like currency exchange and the places where we could change it around town and the different like tourist locations we had to see. So like we would go on this trip and we're all invested. And it just became a habit, um, at least for me. After growing up, I just wanted to keep on doing this. I became a software engineer where, you know, the mythology or the um, dream is that uh, software engineers can work on a beach, right? Like, right. They <laughs> and they're sipping margaritas on the beach while coding, which yeah. in reality, I've tried it. It doesn't work, but uh, the discussion for a different time. So I intentionally left the U.S. to start a company that of remote workers. Like that's another thing before COVID, um, remote work was not seen as real work. It was, uh, a lot of people thought it was like, I don't know, you're freelancing or it's not a real company or something. So I was very adamant that it was. And I like literally started a company to prove that as in both to myself that it could happen and just to do it because that's the work, life I wanted. Um, so my company was created intentionally so I could travel, um, so I could have the freedom to travel. And um, my company is now absorbed by a company in the US, but it's the only reason I, I partnered with that company was also because they have the same philosophy where everybody on the team is remote. We all work, we're all in different countries around the world and it doesn't really matter where you are. So that's been a key cornerstone for me uh, for a long time and how I've designed my life. That's awesome. And I really love that you shared about your mom having you and your sister do assigned different responsibilities when you traveled as kids, because I mean, I think one of the number one reasons why people don't do stuff like this, you know, a, a traveler, they're waiting, you know, for a, a travel buddy or whatever it might be is fear. And yeah. so you kind of saw and, and fear in a multiple things, currency exchange, getting a SIM card, all these little things that you, you know, you have to do when you get to a new country um, as a remote worker those things can be scary if you've never experienced them before. So I think it's really cool that you were doing some of that, you know, as a, as a kid. kid. So that's really cool. Yeah, no, it was, it really took away the fear out of, uh, of traveling because I remember back in the day when my parents were filling out the visa forms or, you know, like the documents you would need. I remember being like a 12 year old or 14 year old and it just looking so daunting. I'm like, yeah. how do they even know what to write out in the forms? Right. Like, this is so many questions. I don't even know the answers of half of them. But after you've seen it happen like four or five times, you're just kind of like, oh, okay, I think I could do this now. And then you do it your first time and it, it's it, you realize it's doable. Then the second time, by the third time, you just don't even think about it anymore. It's, it seems like a no brainer. And I think you can apply that process too with pretty any, almost anything in life where things are scary until you have to do it until you've seen it done a few times. 
And then you realize, okay, this is not as bad as I thought it was going to be, or, you know, that, that fear kind of disappears. And so, yeah, that, that is very cool. Yeah. I, another example of that is actually starting a business, right? Mm-hmm. So Definitely. I always tell a lot of friends of mine who are like, they have a nine to five job, but they're mm-hmm. entrepreneurial at heart. I always try to tell them just have a business and just have a company in your back pocket. Like, and that sounds weird, but like there's so many uses of having a company in the world we we live in that people, it's very underrated. You know, having an LLC that protects you from doing experiments and like the cards I did, because I could have totally done the cards and it failed, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then like, God forbid, let's say something, someone sued me because I don't know, something happened with the cards and it cost them a lot of money. Well, if I did it in my name, they would like be suing me and my actual net worth and my life it could ruin my life, my life as opposed to if I had a business where, you know, it would like affect the business only and I'm, I'm shielded by that. Right? right. So like, but then nobody wants to start a business because they think you have to be at it nine to five every day. There's all these like preconceived ideas of how hard it is to own a company right. that nobody, a very few people actually start doing it. But then once you've done it once, twice, filed your taxes a couple of times, it, you know, spinning up a second business, a third one doesn't feel as hard anymore. Right. Kind of. Yeah. So what's been the biggest benefit, would you say, to having time and location independence? Um, the biggest benefit is expanding my perspective on the world. So Nigeria is a hard country to live in for many reasons. It's just there are geopolitical uh, complexities in the region. <laughs> it's not easy to travel outside Nigeria also. Um, it's not easy to do business, as I, as I mentioned earlier. So a lot of Nigerians think that Nigeria is the worst country in the world. Um, you would hear a lot of commentary mm-hmm. like this. But then from traveling to other African countries and exposing myself, it's not, it's far from the worst. Um, Mm -hmm. I would say if you're ranking the whole 240 countries in the world, I would say it's bang in the middle. There are a bunch of really, really harder places to live um, Mm -hmm. due to wars, due to just like they don't even have resources to sell due to many things. But the, I would say the most, the biggest benefit from traveling the world is I gain perspective. I see mm-hmm. like different ways people and communities and cultures are solving the same problems all over. And I get to bring that back to my life and pick and choose the ones that work best for me. It increases my problem solving toolbox by a huge amount. That would be the biggest benefit for me. Yeah. And it's funny that you, that you say that because, you know, before I started working with, with Golden Shovel, I was an economic developer in California. And I know that economic developers out there will agree with me that, you know, we hear quite a bit from, you know, the community that, you know, there's difficulties and um, you see it on Facebook all the time. People saying where they live is, is the worst, the worst roads, the worst this and that. But when you travel, (laughs) You really, I mean, you're, you hit the nail on the head. You see things from a completely different um, perspective. You see what else is out there. I've seen some pretty bad roads <laughs> that, I, I wa- that I literally was taking pictures of and sending back home saying, okay, we definitely yeah. don't have the worst roads. <laughs> you were know? like, yes, you too, right? Like, how are the roads there? I remember uh, yeah. getting pictures that they were pretty exciting. Yes. Um, yes. Very exciting. There was some, um, yeah, there were a number of roads. Actually, they're doing construction in Kenya, oh, in, yeah. uh, that is Nairobi, true. and that was, it was pretty bad. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think they were doing construction and maybe fixing it. I don't know. But um, it's interesting. You, you can really tell kind of who, you know, who's traveled and who isn't just from the perspectives and that people bring to stuff and So how would uh, employers or companies benefit, would you say, from like allowing more flexible schedules and flexible work environments? Um, One, they, like I said, they get a broader range of uh, skill sets, like Mm -hmm. a diversity in ways of seeing the world solving problems. They also could, if they, if they engineer it correctly, they could have a company that works 24 seven, literally, right? Because if you have people staggered in time zones, 
-hmm. And it depends on the, the company you have. Like some companies don't need to have such a workforce, but then a company, let's say that deals in customer service, if you have a workforce that's global, you literally could have a 24 seven company that at any given time, there's somebody available to pick up the phone or answer a question or attend to a customer. So there are, and then there are tax benefits depending on where you incorporate your company. There are um, immigration benefits where like, if you start your company in a certain country, you get to bring a bunch of your workers along and give them visas to the country. So there are a whole bunch of stuff wow. that I think is interesting um, if you if you're own a business and you're trying to open it internationally, you don't necessarily have to do it in your home country. Um, this is something that a lot of people don't take into account, but there are a lot of countries out there in the world that, that need, uh, their population is not enough to generate the amount of work they're capable of handling or the amount of money they want to generate. So they make pretty favorable environments for business people. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a couple like Dubai is one that has pushed, the UAE is one that has pushed a lot in recent times. Um, Portugal is trying to get a lot of remote workers by reducing taxes on uh, people who are working remotely. So there are a lot of opportunities out there that if you own a remote business, you could benefit from. Definitely. So when you're looking at where to go, like when you're traveling from uh, Nigeria, what are there specific resources that you look for when you're when you're choosing the location that you want to go to? Yes, definitely. I uh, to remain um, a digital nomad, uh, you have to be connected at all times, right? right? So having good cell phone service very important. Having data on your cell phone is critical. Um, having good Wi-Fi wherever you're going. The Airbnb, the hotel, like, so this is why companies like Hacker Paradise is great is because mm -hmm. they get to confirm all this stuff ahead of time for you. Mm -hmm. um, I've also joined website like nomadlist.com that basically they give you crowdsourced information for people who need these resources. But yes, I would say having a cell phone, constant electricity, and Wi-Fi are the most critical things for me to have whenever I'm going to any country or location. Yeah, Hacker Paradise was great. I mean, having that, uh, you know, reassurance heading heading there in advance or the reassurance in advance when you're heading there um, of the good Wi-Fi connection and knowing yeah. you'll get a SIM card when you get there, all of that stuff was um, yeah. invaluable. And even, and even better is like, even if those things don't work or they break down, you have someone to complain to, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of their job to make sure that it gets back up and running. It, you know, just having that form of support sometimes is great. So what, what could communities do to be more attractive to remote workers? Immigration po policies would help, right? So the ease of getting a visa or the visa free access to the place if they want to attract these kind of people um, them having infrastructure on the ground right like it being able to get a cell phone easily until recently like nigeria you had to have a national id number to get a cell phone here and that was a huge problem because there are a bunch of foreigners that live here and they're never going to get a national id number so that's an issue Right. So, but that's solved now, but that's just an example of people being able to get access to resources in the country easily. Like uh, one of my coworkers has been complaining that in France for him to get like a contract line, he has to have a French bank account. And then to get a French bank account, I, I imagine you have to have a French ID, right? <laughs> so there are these layers where it's like, so it's not easy for me to just go chill in France for two months. It gets complicated and it's ex more expensive than if I was living there like a local. So little things like that. Um, that makes help. sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So kind of thinking down the line of, of what requiring something is going to cause, not just like the first step in getting that, but down the line, you know, like you're saying, like, yeah, you just need a French bank account, but what do you need for that? And, and kind of thinking beyond just what they're exactly yeah. so you're a software developer you're you have your side business and you travel how do you balance all of that <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a loaded question <laughs> uh, that, yeah no it's a valid question because it's hard um mm -hmm. 
you, like I said, you always have stuff to do. You have to compartmentalize your time. Um, you have to be uh, self-motivated. And this is why having business partners help in both businesses is someone can, due to what's happening in your life or in other businesses, other people can carry the slack for you. Um, so it's, it's tough, uh, but I think it's doable. Um, it's not, I don't think it's that rocket science It's just yeah. the challenge I've chosen. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so I, I will deal with the, the spoils and the, the consequences of what I chose. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's get into some, um, travel experience questions. So, um, I want to hear about your funniest travel moment. My funniest travel moment, huh? Most of the funny travel moments I've had are mostly, you know, uh, moments between friends <laughs> that yeah. like it, it's, it's a inside joke or only yeah. someone I would understand. Well, can, I can think of one of yours, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, tell me, tell me, like, I would love to, I would love to. You know, what's funny. So when I, when I interviewed Alexis, we talked about the monkeys, but what, what I had forgotten about and what was probably the funniest monkey moment was when the monkey jumped over the car in the safari or were, oh, you, yeah. sleeping? were you sleeping for that or were you? No, I, I, was, I was, I was definitely awake and like that. Yeah, that I don't know if that was funny or if that was just a batshit scary. <laughs> it was, because, well, it was funny in retrospect, right? Because when after it happened, like 30 seconds later, everybody was laughing, yeah. but it literally, you know, um, it was like a planet of the apes moment where you're yeah. thinking we were getting surrounded by monkeys and you started wondering if they, we were going to get attacked or if they were just going to steal our backpacks or, you know, as in, and they just literally like scared the shit out of us and we all <laughs> Yeah, that was, it was definitely funny. <laughs> well, I'm just glad that there was a camera rolling. I yes. mean, when, you know, I just, that monkey sitting on the car and then, you know, if, for, for the listeners there, we, um, you know, the safari car ha or the safari truck has like a totally open top. So it's sitting on the hood of the car and we're videotaping it. And the monkey decides to just jump straight over the vehicle. And we're thinking it's coming inside the car. <laughs> And it did not, luckily, but yeah, that was yeah. pretty funny. That was one of my most favorite moments. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was, and everybody was literally screaming. And it, it yeah. seemed like out of like a, a movie. Yeah, was, that was a good time, a good times. <laughs> What's been uh, your most adventurous location? I would say it is Colombia. I went to Colombia last year in June. It's a country that is very underrated. People always worry that it's dangerous. I don't feel it's, I didn't feel in danger, but at the same time, the terrain of the country was very interesting. Like they had desert terrain, they had rainforests, they had in Bogota where it was a city, it felt like I was in Denver, Colorado. This was the first country I had been to where barely anyone spoke English. Like I've been to Mexico, but you know, if you go to the tourist areas, you could get away with English or in Argentina that I was just at, like you could get away with English, but in Colombia, <laughs> you literally, uh, you, you got to figure out some Spanish. So I was yeah. walking around with Google Translate. Um, the culture is very different and it's also very strong. Um, you feel it in every town. So like it was a very adventurous travel experience for me. Yeah. Awesome. Tell me about a troublesome moment. Have you ever gotten lost or just kind of gotten into a sticky situation? Yes, I have. Um, I think I got into one recently. Um, was it in Argentina or even Kenya? Well, a common one that happens to me all the time is uh, I get to a new country. I do not have a cell phone for the country and there is no Wi-Fi at the airport. You know, they're not speaking English in the airport. <laughs> you, it's hard to communicate what you're trying to say. And you don't have any resources to do any translation or communicate with the other people you're there with. I've had a couple of interesting situations. Like, well, in Argentina, they just lost my bag getting there. So that was exciting. Yeah. Um, I had four days where I didn't have a bag. I had to go buy new clothes. The airline gave me $75, but that didn't really do anything. Yeah. <laughs> One shirt I bought was already like 60. So that was out the window. Oh. 
but uh, my bag came back intact and everything was good. So it worked out. Another one was, well, this was uh, uh, not a so good story. In Kenya, when I landed, the immigration told me that they wouldn't let me pass unless I gave them $50. And this was had nothing to do with immigration. They just said I had to pay $50 if I wanted to pass. <laughs> so like, yeah, there's always uh, some interesting uh, stuff going on when you're in a different country and i'm not saying this to scare people who <laughs> are debating traveling but like they, like i'm totally fine i've never been in prison in any country of my own country <laughs> so, so it's not a problem so it, it's totally possible to be in a sticky situation you just have to be creative and most of the time um, if you're in a country that's not yours having a smile on your face and being friendly and playful usually helps you get by yeah. Like if you climb up and get all like aggressive or defensive, mm-hmm. I feel like it could put you in more trouble. If you like end up like smiling and being friendly, um, they probably just, most of the time they just let me, they just say, just leave, go away. <laughs> <laughs> just leave. And everything is fine. Have you had any, besides the monkeys, have you had any interesting animal encounters? Well, and uh, we had a safari in Kenya. I think Kenya has been the most animal-packed trip I have done, um, as a at least working and traveling. Um, as a kid, I went to Zimbabwe, but that's like that's a different thing entirely. But uh, Kenya, like yeah, so you know, we saw giraffes, we experienced monkeys every day, um, we saw elephants. So yeah, there's uh, there's. Those, I think Kenya was packed with a lot of animal encounters, even in yeah. Lamu with the donkeys, right? So, oh, yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. And didn't Alexis almost get run over by a donkey, I, if I recall <laughs> correctly? <That's possibly. laughs> Have you, uh, what's been your favorite um, historical destination? Hmm, that's a good question. Off the top of my head, I would go with the most impactful historically for me was actually Ghana, Ghana and the Gambia, because uh, Ghana, I got to go to like the gate of no return and they had like a castle where a lot of the slave trade was done. And uh, it was very educational for me. I had never seen anything up close and personal about the slave trade till then. Wow. Um, in the Gambia, there's a famous person called Kwame Nkrumah. I think he was the first slave to trace back. Uh, Kunta Kinte was the first slave to trace back his roots back to the Gambia. So that was also a very interesting tour and, you know, historical facts that I learned throughout the trip and places I saw and things like that. Yeah, like everywhere I go, I always try to figure out the history of the people. I always go for like a historical tour and, you know, even with Colombia, with like the myths and mythologies that they have there and uh, the mythology of El Dorado and their history with gemstones and gold. They have so much. So I'm always a big fan of learning more about the history of every country I go to. Definitely. Same here. Last question. Can you share your top travel hack? What's the most impactful thing you've learned traveling? Oh, I have a lot. I'll give you a couple. Uh, One, for super long flights, I would book economy and most airlines, at least, I think most Star Alliance airlines. If you look at your ticket, there's always a place where you could bid for an upgrade to business class. I would always like just put in a bid of the very lowest amount I could put in. And usually like if the business class is not full for the airline's point of view, them getting an extra couple of hundred dollars from you is better than nothing. So they would just give it to you anyway. So the only reason you would not get business class is if business class was full. So um, at least in the time of COVID, I have 100% got every flight I bid for. So that's a... Oh my goodness. I'm kind of worried telling everybody now because everybody's <laughs> going to go try. <laughs> you taught me something today. So. <laughs> oh, I'm that's happening. I am doing that for now. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Um, yeah. Another one is, so if you're from this part of the world, like at least in Nigeria, we only have, unlike Americans, we only have 40 countries we can go to without applying for a visa. And a visa mm-hmm. is a long, lengthy process. Another travel hack is the 
American visa and the Schengen visa. The Schengen visa is the visa for the European region, like the most of EU countries are within the Schengen zone. Um, so if you have a Schengen visa or, a, or an American one, there are countries that let you in because you have those visas. So you don't need the visa of that country. So with the US visa, you could get into Mexico, for example, you don't need to go to the Mexican embassy. Or you could go get into Serbia, which is in Eastern Europe, or you could get into Montenegro, which is in Eastern Europe or Croatia. For people who don't have a lot of visa free access, people from India, Nigeria, China, um, these are definitely travel hacks that I've learned over the years uh, to go to countries that I would not naturally want to go through the stress mm -hmm. of figuring out like the paperwork to go to them. But because I want to go to somewhere new, I will totally use my already active visas to go there. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Um, really was excited to share your story and uh, share about the playing card business with our listeners. So can you actually share your website or social media, whatever links people can find you at if they wanted to check out your playing cards? Oh, definitely. So for my playing cards, it's called nativescards.com. And then I guess for my software consultancy, that's uh, the name is Skyward if you need an app, but the URL is shoot Skyward. So shoot as in like shooting a gun, but shoot skyward.com. Yeah, you could totally check out the other apps we've built for people, uh, governments and organizations all over the world. And uh, yeah, those are the two okay. main ways to see stuff we, I've built. Thank you, Amanda, for another very interesting discussion um, in your remote worker series. We actually have another um, edition of the remote, remote worker series coming up very soon. We're going to have those coming back to back, so stay tuned for that on Shovel Talk. Let's play the uh, Golden Shovel social media game at Facebook, like us at Shovel Toss, Twitter, follow us at Gold Shovel, LinkedIn, follow us, Golden Shovel. And YouTube, please subscribe, Golden Shovel Agency. Um, as far as Golden Shovel Education that's out there, um, we just put a wrap on a on a series of housing webinars and ebooks. Got a lot of great response from those, and uh, those are on the Golden Shovel website. So if you have not checked those out, you can still do it. They'll be there. Check them out on GoldenShovel.com. And speaking of GoldenShovel.com, we recently launched a redesigned website. Uh, did a lot of work on that. A lot of members of the GSA team uh, had their hands in that. Um, so we're proud of our new look and feel on the web. So please go check that out. Like I said, um, episode three of Amanda's Remote Worker Series is coming up soon. And in the meantime, have a wonderful 4th of July, and we'll see you next time on Shovel Talk. Thank you.